Did you know that two out of every three guys are going to experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? Yeah, yeah, I did know that one. For me, I uh, I was I shaved my head at 26. I think I was bald at 25. It, it was fast. But I wish keeps have been around when I was younger because advancements in science meant that there are treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. You see the wording there? Keep the hair you have. That's why it's not going to work for me. It's too late for me. My hair's not coming back. But you don't have to be like me. Stop hair loss early with Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs that treat hair loss. So. While you might have tried those drugs before, never at a price this low. If you were thinking oh, it's gonna be super expensive, it's medicine, Simon, and I live in America. I broke my leg and I had to sell my house. Well, it's not funny. It's not funny at all. But keep starts at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one thing, there's no need to visit a doctor's office, just schedule a quick online consult, and a bit later, discreet package arrives at your door and you can use it in the privacy of your own home. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, it's not going to fix itself. Really isn't. Do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash side projects or click the link in the description below for 50% off your first order. And now today's video. Tsunamis are a uniquely devastating natural disaster, something all the more noteworthy given how simple they are. Caused by earthquakes deep under the sea, the water transfers the energy across vast distances, sometimes if the quake is strong enough, across entire oceans in the form of giant waves. The danger posed by tsunamis to coastal areas has been understood since coastal areas were first settled and they figure deeply into the history of countries that have long dealt with them, often construed as the anger of the gods. These days we have a better understanding of tsunamis and with that understanding comes ways to protect ourselves from them and that's specifically in the form of technology. So let us show you how the world protects people from tsunamis. As we've said, tsunamis are caused by earthquakes. So how does an earthquake happen? Well, as you might remember from your grade school science classes, the Earth moves very slowly, but it does move. The thing is, rocks in the Earth's crust, that's the part that you live on, don't like to move. They're very heavy and they're jagged and they get caught and stuck on each other and sometimes they get so stuck that they can't move anymore. But the earth underneath doesn't stop just because the rocks are being difficult. It keeps moving and it pushes and it pushes until finally the rocks can't take it anymore and they violently shake themselves apart until they end up where they're supposed to be. What makes things interesting is when the earthquakes happen underwater, water conforms to the shape that holds it, and certain earthquakes can suddenly shift the ocean floor in quite a dramatic fashion. When this happens, the water above moves with the seabed. We call this displacement. The water will then carry the energy of that movement because that's what water does, creating massive waves that keep going until they either dissipate or hit dry land. It's usually the latter. There are three general rules that experts look for in terms of tsunami generation. First, was the earthquake under land or was it underwater? If it was under land, no need to worry. Well, I mean, you'd still need to worry, just not about giant waves coming your way. Second, what was the magnitude of the earthquake? Earthquakes are not measured linearly. The magnitude scale is logarithmic. In English, that means that a magnitude 7 earthquake is exponentially more powerful than a magnitude 6. In terms of a tsunami, an earthquake that was under a magnitude of 8 is generally less likely to cause a tsunami, while above 8 it is generally considered more likely. Third, and finally, what type of earthquake was it? Earthquakes happen on fault line, and what type of fault line it is determines the strength and severity of the earthquake. Tsunamis are, at the most basic level, a displacement of water, and that displacement is usually created by one type of earthquake, a convergent fault, where the earthquake causes one side of the fault line to rise suddenly, displacing the water above it. 
To be clear, these are not ironclad rules. Strike, slip, earthquakes, but no magnitude 8 have formed tsunamis before. How? Well, one 2018 earthquake in Indonesia caused part of the seafloor to fall, and a huge amount of material was displaced, which in turn displaced the water, which caused a tsunami. Even if they were must-have requirements, it's to the relative misfortune of beach lovers everywhere that it's relatively easy to get a bingo with all three, because A. Earthquakes happen underwater all the time, because there's tons of water on Earth. B. Those earthquakes tend to be extremely powerful and see that's because a significant number of the fault lines underwater are enormous reverse faults, not strike slips. So, that's tsunamis, earthquakes, and water broken down for you. Now you understand the tsunamis, you can understand how to spot for them and how experts work to keep you from being killed by them. Before today's technological capabilities, tsunami warnings were based on, for the most part, guessing. A tsunami travels, depending on conditions, between 500 and 1,000 kilometers an hour, or 0.14 and 0.28 kilometers a second. The seismic waves of the earthquakes that cause them, however, travel much, much faster, typically about 14,000 kilometers an hour, or around 4 kilometers a second. Since the seismic waves can be detected far earlier than the actual waves, that provides the basis for an early warning signal. The problems with this approach are obvious, given that there's not a huge amount of information to go off just from seismic waves. Second, if the earthquake happens just offshore, like for example Japan in 2011, then there isn't a lot of time to alert people to the possible danger. Thankfully, today we have something a little more sophisticated in the form of tsunami early warning networks. So let's break them down, starting with America's. That's right, the United States has a tsunami early warning network. Did you know about it? America's network, called DART for Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunamis, is situated in the Pacific Ocean because tsunamis don't really happen in the Atlantic. That's because the Atlantic Fault is a divergent fault, as in the plates are moving away from each other, which produces fewer earthquakes and barely any tsunamis. The ideas for an early warning network were first floated in the 20th century, following the catastrophe that was the 1960 Valdivia earthquake in Chile. The Valdivia quake was the most powerful earthquake in recorded history, and it produced a tsunami so powerful that it crossed the entire Pacific Ocean. On its merry way across the seas, the tsunami slammed into Hawaii, killing 61 people in the town of Hilo. America decided that it would be best if their primary naval base in the Pacific wasn't so vulnerable to, well, the ocean, and so they designed a system to provide warnings of potential waves. The first part of the network consists of large, durable buoys combined with pressure sensors anchored to the ocean floor. These combination sensors are deployed at strategic locations all around the Pacific, measuring wave heights and pressure while monitoring for any suspicious changes in either. When such changes are measured, they are transmitted to a satellite listening in because satellites are absolute game changers in terms of weather observation. That satellite then transfers the data to a computer where a bunch of experts and algorithms crunch the numbers and make the determination whether a tsunami warning must be issued or not. If they believe there's a wave coming, evacuations are ordered, and everyone has to get to higher grounds. That's how the system works to detect a tsunami, but that's only half the job. Of equal importance is getting the warning out to the people in the tsunami's path, and that's done in a myriad of different ways. Warnings are delivered via text, email, radio, and even inlaid messages on television screens. Much of this is automated, ensuring that people everywhere can be warned. And it's a good thing, too, because it most definitely saves thousands of lives when it counts. Let's shift from America to the other side of the Pacific now. Japan is one of the worst locations in the entire world for tsunamis. Right off the coast is a convergent fault where one plate slipped under another. These are by far the worst fault lines for powerful earthquakes and it proved so 10 years ago. On March the 11th, 2011, at 2.46 in the afternoon, a magnitude 9.1 earthquake struck off the coast of Japan on this exact fault line. The earthquake lasted all of six minutes, which doesn't sound that long, but in earthquake terms is an eternity. The initial earthquake was devastating enough, damaging buildings and causing liquefaction of the soil, but the worst part was still to come. On the seafloor, the quake caused an upthrust of 6 to 8 meters along a seabed 180 kilometers wide, causing an enormous tsunami. Thankfully, Japan has a robust system similar to America's, possibly even more so since they have seawalls and more to protect against water surges. Warnings were sent out, evacuations were ordered, and many people made it to safety. But the scale of the tsunami overwhelms things. The waves were high enough to go over the seawalls, spilling into populated areas and reaching several miles inland. Hundreds 
hundreds of designated evacuation sites were tragically washed away. Most waves reached heights of several meters, with some reports that the waves reached up to 40 meters high in places. And in the most well-known disaster of the event, the Fukushima nuclear power plant suffered a meltdown directly caused by the tsunami. As a result of this disaster, nearly 20,000 people lost their lives. But considering the fact that this was the fourth most powerful earthquake in recorded history, as well as one of the most powerful tsunamis in history, the fact that the damage wasn't worse is a testament to how these systems save lives when it really matters. Take, for example, another infamous tsunami in Asia. In 2004, a magnitude 9.3 earthquake occurred off the coast of the island of Sumatra in Indonesia, producing a tsunami with waves up to 30 meters high in some places. In this disaster, 11 times as many people from 14 different countries lost their lives compared to the Japan earthquake as they lacked the same early warning systems that might have warned people to head to higher grounds. It's a tragedy, and it's a good reason to invest in more of these systems in places where they're needed. And relatively speaking, these systems are dirt cheap to run compared to some of the other things that governments are known to splurge on, like tanks or missiles. Hell, America only built theirs because Hawaii is a naval base. So, well. It's always got something to do with the military, doesn't it? So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.